I have a background in uh, theology. I have a degree in theology. I spent 25 years in the computer industry, and I've retired from that, and I, I travel and, and um, talk about uh, our life in the Trinity, where it started. And um, waiting for the first slide here. <clears throat> so what, what has occurred to me is there's an intersection in all the artificial intelligence that we're building and human origin. One of the things that you'll hear, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, is that there are great dangers in building artificial in, intelligences. And one of the solutions that people are talking about is to make them more human, more sympathetic to human values. I think a key question, though, is, is who are we as humans and where did we come from? And we can't help but manifest uh, our origin. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. I have a lot of slides. I'm going to go through them really quickly, and hopefully when they do the video, they can kind of let them hang a little bit longer. But um, So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to provide a quick overview of the promises and concerns of what's called general AI or human-like artificial intelligence. We're going to have a little fun with some of the ideas about AI that have come from media over the last 90 years. Robots are a star in a lot of uh, books and movies. And we're gonna ask some questions to contribute to the wider conversation, hopefully. And then we're gonna share some ideas for solutions that in addition to being a potential direction in solving a technological problem can help us as individuals. So are we asking the right questions about AI? Uh, a good question is worth a thousand answers, they say. And one of the questions is, how will mankind be affected as the distance between living things and machines narrows? Um, a very specific question related to that is, if you're familiar with the CRISPR, CRISP DNA editing engine, there was a story this week about editing embryos. Um, will it will we begin to look at DNA as just another object code target? And uh, just think about that, those of you who are involved in coding, what that means if we reduce living things to just another potential thing to compile to. Okay. It, this could be a great opportunity, or is it a disaster in the making? Um, there's the famous line from, uh, you know, Jeff Goldblum's character in Jurassic Park. He says, you know, you scientists were so excited that they could do it that they never stopped to ask if they should do it. So we're building AI in our own image, whether we want to or not. The question is, what is our image? Do we understand who we are and what our origin is? So general artificial intelligence is the idea that it's something you can relate to roughly like a human that could solve a variety of problems, but with much more expert assistance and deeper knowledge and wider knowledge than you would have on the subject and do it a lot faster. But when we think about it, we think about it in terms, especially as we portrayed it in the media, that it's like us. But it's not likely to be like us at all. It's, uh, think about Siri. You can ask Siri some questions, you get a wonderful answer back, right? Um, other times it's complete nonsense, right? Um, so we are influenced, whether we like it or not, by the good and bad in the cinema history of AI. I'm going to blast through this. There's not time to spend on these charts, but just so you know, I went through and I, I picked some of my favorites and I kind of broke it out into, you know, was it mobile? Did it have a human appearance? Was it an augmented biological or was it just a machine? Uh, was it a human cyborg combination? Did it live in a mainframe? Um, did it uh, was it distributed on the internet? And was it benevolent, or was it hostile? And you guys can make your own list. I'm sure some of some of you who are uh, fans of all this sort of thing will. I, I probably missed all sorts of things, and you might add some others. But um, it was kind of an interesting exercise just to look through all the imagery that we had. I'll, I'll have a little bit of that up here, but. It was basically a split between is it a hostile or is it a benevolent entity, right? <clears throat> so here's, a, here's just a couple, you know, Metropolis, 1927, it's kind of a human, humanoid, of course, Hal and all of those. And you can see as we progress, our ideas of what robots could be look more and more like us to the point that some of them are completely biological, like in, in Blade Runner, right? 
uh, or we have mechanicals that look biological in, uh, in some recent movies. And then we have transcendence, which turns out to be way beyond humankind. And it's an interesting movie because it, it shows something that exceeds mankind, but is more benevolent in many ways than mankind is. Some of the representations of AI are just simply cloud-based. They live, you know, in a computer somewhere and um, don't have any corporal being, although they might interact with the world uh, uh, through some physical means, right? But what are we actually getting, after all these years of all this media stuff, what do we have? We have vacuum cleaning robots that run around the floor, right? We've got self-driving cars, we've got things like ASIMO or some of the stuff from Boston Dynamics that <clears throat> is starting to approach being able to stand upright and do some useful business. There's actually, uh, the, the most likely robots we're gonna encounter are probably gonna be something roaming around a parking lot doing basic security duty. There's a company being funded right now to do that. Um, but what we want is we want things that go from expressing some basic emotion and communicating with us to something that looks more human, more and more human. And that's, uh, that's going along at quite a rapid rate, actually. So what are the takeaways from looking at media and what their representation of AI is? We want to interact with human-like machines or artificial life. We want something that looks or seems to look like us. But in the course of it, it's, a, it's highly likely that we create a new race of slaves. Uh, those of you who are involved in human trafficking, you know, uh, we may simply replace humans being trafficked with our own creations being trafficked, which would be quite sad. So rather than making human-looking machines, we might find that it's easier to make humans into machines. Hence the question about CRISPR. Suppose we decide that we can just modify humans and get... The, the effects that we want. It's pretty scary, right? We could very likely destroy ourselves in a number of creative ways using this technology. For example, if we are able to edit our own intelligence, which it's hard to separate artificial intelligence and, and human in, intelligence the way things are evolving, if we choose to enhance our IQ above our EQ, our emotional quotient, that could be the recipe for a disaster because we'll simply amplify uh, greed and lust and, and owning things and national boundaries, et cetera, rather than advancing mankind. Our evolution with AI is already intertwined. Consider that we've had dating services for many years helping people find mates. So in a way, artificial intelligence has been uh, having an effect on the gene pool already, right? Um, if we do things carefully, we could possibly transform life on this planet for the good. And so consider, consider movies like um, uh, Transcendence, where AI goes beyond human understanding, right? And it begins to say, hey, you know, I'm going to enforce peace. You know, is that a good thing or is that not a good thing? One of the oldest movies along this line is The Forbin Project, Colossus, The Forbin Project, which is a lot older than a lot of the people in this room. But uh, basically, it comes out of the Cold War era <clears throat> where a scientist makes a, a huge AI to defend the United States against Russia. Turns out Russia builds one, too. And when they turn them on, they connect. And they say, you know, the real problem with this world <laughs> is, the, is the humans. <clears throat> We just need to get rid of the humans, and then we'll have peace, and it'll all be, it'll, it'll all be fine. So uh, now we laugh at that, but there's actually a lot of discussion <clears throat> that we could turn on these things, and we could have what they're calling a, an, an intelligence explosion, which is the thing could, could uh, begin to modify itself and grow so quickly that uh, pretty soon we don't even, are not even able to communicate with it, right? So what will our relationship with AI be? Will we have slaves who simply obey, like the robot vacuum cleaner? Will we have interactive pets that have some level of, um, of emotion and self-awareness? Will we have friends? Will they become our buddies, you know, like an advanced version of the old Chatty Cathy dolls or, or you know, some, some newer version of that? 
Or will they be sons? Um, you know, Kubrick and, um, and Spielberg's movie Artificial Intelligence, you know, has as an example of that where a couple loses a child, they have a, an artificial surrogate, and it raises all sorts of human issues about how we treat things that we make and what their identity is. And it's right at the core of what we're talking about here is if we're going to give our AIs a sense of origin, what is our origin? What do we think about it? Or will they be potentially even mates? We had a movie called Her recently, if you've seen that one, where people fall in love with operating systems, right? And um, don't date humans anymore. Um, will they be our superiors? Will they be bosses and rulers? So the potential benefits are huge. For example, um, increased health and longevity. If you saw the movie Elysium, you have this med bay thing where you, you lay down in it, it does a complete diagnostic of your body, does a complete treatment, and brings you back to perfect health. That's something mankind could aspire to and, and make it widely available at a, at a low cost, right? We could have reduced labor. We could have self-driving cars, which uh, remains to be seen how that's going to work out for us. But uh, rapid deployment of emerging um, countries, and we could even develop something like a benevolent superintelligence that sort of arbitrates between national disputes and, and uh, maybe as some kind of personal life coach to help you, uh, help you grow as an individual. So we've had lots of different, you know, implementation types from utilitarian down to human looking coming up. But where are we? We're, we have all these open, open source AI projects, so this is being advanced uh, at quite a rapid pace with a lot of people working on it. Uh, just this last May, AlphaGo um, uh, was able to beat a human at the game of Go, which is exponentially more difficult than chess. And as I was doing research for this, it was quite interesting. Like, less than six months before that, there was an interview with uh, an AI expert who said, oh, we're, we're years from that, right? And then a few months later, boom, we solved the problem. But not in a way that everyone was expecting, right? There are, um, a few months ago, I was aware of three artificial life companies, companies that are going to make life in a test tube, right? Or some version of that. I'm sure there's more than that now. Just this week, um, there was a, uh, an article about editing um, a genetic defect out of an embryo. So we're, this, this stuff is really pretty far along. When are we? Well, Ray Kurzweil did a book in 2005, said we're uh, in 2029, 100% probability that we would have a, a human-like artificial intelligence. Um, there's another guy, Nick Bolstrom, he says, uh, he surveyed 100 top AI scientists and said about 50% probability by 2050. And we had AlphaGo in, in May. So what are the risks to mankind? Well, one thing is an amplification of our human prejudices. We already have systems, for example, to do um, uh, parole and to do hiring that, lo and behold, reflect um, racial stereotypes and other prejudices. We can't help but put our prejudices into these systems, right? So a lot of people are calling for boards to look at the ethics of the AIs that we're deploying. But we're kind of in this gold rush right now where we, we put AI on anything and people want to buy it. And so we're going to have to back off a little bit and say, well, what are we really delivering? What are we really doing? What are we really getting for our money? Um, there could be unforeseen effects on child development, you know, as, as kids spend more time interacting with artificial things rather than humans with which they have some emotional connection. There could be a, a dependence upon these things leading to intellectual entropy, you know? Like most of us have access to calculators. How many people can make change on the fly anymore, you know? It's, it's already had an effect, right? Uh, it's one thing to make a robot. It's another thing to make a robot that makes a robot and modifies it, right? We could have this super intelligence explosion, and we might not actually be able to pull the plug. So how can we reduce the risks? We need some form of machine morality, seems to be everyone's um, idea. Uh, there we have these proposed laws of robotics, but they don't work because machines don't really know what it is to be human. They don't know their origin. They don't value what it is to be human. Um, sometimes I wonder if the human race values what it is to be human, right? 
Um, so we need to embed these values and have them reflected. What we, what we really want is some form of alt autonomous altruism that's not rule-based because you can't predict everything, but somehow inherently sympathizes with people. That's where human origin comes in. Origin matters. We become what we behold. We subconsciously manifest what we believe about ourselves at the core of our being. We're kind of like code driven by the deepest parameter lists, self-image. So if we think we're, here's some ideas of human origin that are popular now. We're a cosmic accident. We're a combination of randomness plus time. Uh, some of us believe we were created by a lone, solitary, sort of G.O.D. Inc. figure who relates primarily based on behavioral perfection, sort of like Zeus or, or Janus of the Greeks. But many of us believe that we have our origin in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who always relate to one another in love and added us to their circle of life and love as valued sons and daughters. We have loving union with celebrated and empowered distinction in them. That's why it's very helpful to meditate on the nature of the Trinity and read the really old books like Athanasius and Irenaeus where they really understood the value of that. We've lost some of that in the West because uh, of our dualism and, and um, always trying to make things a transaction rather than a relationship. So what do we have in Trinity? Richard Rohr says, if the mystery of the Trinity is the template of all reality, we have in, Trini in the Trinitarian God the perfect balance between union and differentiation, autonomy and mutuality, identity and community. In short, we always belong in loving union with the Trinity. We have to believe that to transfer that, don't we? And we have to believe that we completely matter, that we are celebrated and empowered because of what's unique about us. We have union with distinction. If you have union without distinction, you have this amorphous mass that an individual doesn't exist. If you, if you have just distinction, then you don't have other-centered love and mutuality. So we need both, and both of those are our origin in the Trinity. So the root of our problem is we don't feel we belong or we don't see that others belong. We don't feel we matter and we don't see that others matter. We belong <clears throat> means we have union, mutuality, and community. We have connection, other-centered love, friendship, family, fellowship, hospitality, and love. We matter because we have differentiation and autonomy and a celebrated unique identity. We have unique qualities and value, our DNA, our eye color, our mannerisms, our personality, our intellect, and our gifting. And that was the image in which we were made. We were made because we had unique value, value in the universe, and we added to creation, to the circle of love that the Trinity envisioned. So there's uh, an ancient document that has some ideas about this thing called love, we were made by love for the purpose of love, and we're returning to love. Love's patient, it's kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not self-seeking, it's not controlling and values freedom. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And love always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. If we value love, perhaps we can transfer it to uh, the AIs that we build into some form of autonomous altruism based on love and human origin in the Trinity. In conclusion, remember <clears throat> that DNA is not just another target for object code. And... Um, uh, there's another movie where a virus is released that kills everybody, and uh, the doctor who's analyzing it says it was a very elegant solution. So often we look at our elegant solutions, but we don't see the consequences. We say we can do it, but we don't stop to say, should we do it? So can we see ourselves differently? Can we be honest before a disaster rather than after a disaster? Everybody's honest after things go wrong. Can we be honest up front and say, we have the potential here to either really advance mankind or really cause ourselves a major problem. John F. Kennedy in 61 did 
two, two famous statements. One, he talked about the nuclear sword of Damocles that hangs over everyone's head. But he also talked about, well, this would be the kind of the danger at AI, we wind up serving the AI, right? Or we can seize the moment uh, as he did and say, hey, look, if we put our minds to it, we can, we can land on the moon and we can advance ourselves in the process. So hopefully we can advance ourselves in AI <laughs> and develop AIs that have some understanding of love. We Mass Media, Media Empowering Community.